Hello everyone, welcome back again. My name is Jesse and in today's tutorial, learn about loops in Julia. So we're learning specifically about for loops. So for loops is part of the control flow of every programming language. We've seen how to work with it in Julia. The basic syntax for working with for loops in Julia goes with this format. So for, the keyword is for and then it goes with the end, right? For i in an iterable, then you do something with whatever you want to do. Okay, so that's the basic syntax. Now let's see an example of what an iterable is, right? But an iterable goes something like this: range. You can use the range to create a simple iterable. So range and then one, then stop. Stop is going to be ten, right? So this is how to create a range in Julia. So there's a whole tutorial on how to work with range in Julia. If you do it like this, a previous version to work, but in the current version, if I do this stuff here, it's going to give us a method error, right? So this is not supported now. This is for version zero point six. And down so okay, perfect. So the current method is go with this format or just simply go with i then this right. I said i one is to ten, which is just which is a result of this given. So it's a whole tutorial on this, so you can, you can find it in the playlist or in the description below. Okay, so perfect. So now let's see in case I want to activate over this particular stuff, how do I do that? So I can just go with this so for for i in my range that I had here. Which is starting at one and then it's stopping at ten. Then I just go with print line. I want to print i, right? That is what I want to do. I want to print this particular i here. So if I go with this and then I end it, it's going to I choose the first one, so one is to ten, which is perfect. So that is the concept about four loops. So this is my iterable and I'm looking through. So this thing can be also be done in a different method of looking at it this way as four. Right, and then you can change it. Let's use the simple one that everybody knows. Then it's also going to give us the same result. One is to ten. Perfect. So this is quite interesting. So this is not the only method. You can also do it in another method. Julia is very powerful. It can be done in several ways. So I can also do it instead of bringing the in. I can make it as equal to right, and it's going to look through this particular value, giving us the same value. Okay, perfect. So that is one way of working with range, working with for loops in Julia. So in case I want to include a, a different value outside this particular stuff, this is a scope of its own, right? I want to include this particular value outside into this particular loop. So let's say something like this. I have something like count, right? Then I want to include count, count of zero. I want to include count into this particular value. So if I run this count here, and then I want to include it inside this scoop. So how do I do that? If I do it like that, it's going to show me some very interesting stuff. So for this, then let's use the interpolation, the string interpolation of i. Then I want to go with count. I'm doing something with this particular value, right? That is if you want to do something with the value. That is when if I run this particular stuff here, plus one, right? If I run this here, that is going to give us a count not defined. Why is it given as this error? The reason that this is a scope of its own. It's a scope of its own and it is also another scope. So this is a global scope, this is another scope of it. So you have to be able to allow this scope into this, but this is not seeing it because it's not seeing it as part of this scope. So how do we solve it? So in a previous version of Julia, like 0 0.6, if I do the same thing, let's say count is equal to 0, I can go with for i in 1 is to 10, I go with print line, my scope, my value, right? Then I do counts plus is equal to one, and I go with end. It's going to work perfectly without giving us any error. See that if I run it again, it's going to use the last value which was ten here as my current value, and then keep on running it. So if I do it again, it's going to change it again to twenty one. Here was twenty. Here is now twenty one. So that is something in the previous version because you seeing this one as part of this code, but in the current version. Now, to allow to, to, to work with it, you have to define this particular scope. So, the first solution, there are three different solutions. So the first solution is just this to go with this. So, I'm going to define the count again. It's going to be zero, right? Perfect. And I'm going to use this same stuff here. So, this is it. So, how do I allow it to work? To allow it to work, the first method is just go with global. So, if I go with global, I'm, tell, I'm telling this particular scope inside this scope that this is now a particular scope part of this right so if i go with this stuff here 
and I run it, now it's going to work perfectly. So one is working, giving us the correct result without any error. So this is the first method. The second method is to put it inside a function. So now let's see what I mean by that. So function, then let's go to function main. Then inside this function main, I'm going to put in this stuff that I had here. So perfect, I'll copy this. Then, you know, this is a function, so we must have the end here. Now, since this is a function here, you don't need to define this as a global stuff. So in functions, we don't most often do that. So if I go straight away with this, and I run this, it's going to work without giving us an error. If I run this function, function name, it's going to work perfectly, printing our value here, which is quite interesting and very nice. So that's the second method of solving this issue. Now, the third method is that we just go with the let end. So the let and then end method. Right, so you're going to put inside the let and the end, just like in JavaScript, which is very, very interesting and very nice. So now, in this particular format, I'm just going to go with this same thing that I had here. Right? Copy this, and then let's put it inside between the let and the end. So it's going to be this. So now let count be this. So this, is, this can be done in this format, or I can put it like this. Right? So let count, let count be equal to zero. Then I'll run it here. And it's going to work in a very nice format. You can see that it's working here. So that is the third method of solving this particular issue. So this is making it more interesting. And then it's very interesting. So now it's trying to learn that this particular count is found in this particular scope, right? Or if it's a function, because for Julia everything is encapsulated in the function, it's now seeing that this is a function of its scope. This is a big scope of its own. So this count is part of this function. So it's going to see it and then we recognize it and work straight away. And again, if you don't want to use a function, you can just tell this particular scope with a global variable. So that is how to work with this in version 1.0, of course, right? Now let me just talk about some other stuff you can also do about the zip, right? So zip. So the zip work in this format. So let's say I have something like four, I have two values. Let's say a is going to give us a random number, of, a random number, rand, right? Another number of 10, then let's say B, so A and B, so A and then B, you can also do something like this in Julia, and B, random of 10, and then random number of 10, right? So if I want to look through this particular value that I have here, you can also do the same thing of, this. So that's giving us our values here, and then our values here, right? In case I want to run this particular stuff here, I can also do it like 4. So I and then J, right, in my A and then B, right, so if I do it like that, it's going to, when I bring this zip here, so if I, I'm zipping them together, which is very interesting, so zip, then I can do print line my I, and then let's say, let's give it something different, so that we see that there's a change, and then J, right, this is not the best method of working anyway, but it's still going to work. And then, if I run it like this, now it's going to give us our value in a very nice format, in our terminal. So that's giving us our value here, which is quite interesting. So that is one of the ways of working with the zip format in Julia. So, so I can actually do some other stuff with it if I want to do it in this particular format. So thank you for watching this tutorial. If you have any question or contribution, and just please in the comment section and please don't forget to subscribe. You can check the links below for more. And if you want to, that is a complete set, you can check the link below for more. Thank you and stay.